Hello and welcome to the Butler Bureau Show. Today I'm talking to Stephen Goldsmith, a very fine metal polisher indeed. Hello Stephen, is that you? Hello Clive, yes it is. Well I've really been looking forward to chatting to you Stephen and the visitors have, have been given quite an idea of, uh, of exactly what it is you do and some of the skill set that a, a silversmith has to learn and someone who looks after a fine, uh, well, a fine metal polisher such as yourself. And it's quite incredible, really. I mean, it's not just a question of getting a, a jar of the old silver polish out from under the sink and finding a, finding a rag, is it? It's far more complicated than There's that. It's definitely not anything like that at the very beginning. Silver is not shiny when, when I receive it. It's got hammer marks, it's got file marks, and polishing for the polisher like me is a very industrial type of polishing compared with the, what you would imagine with a duster and the silver polish is not at the very beginning. It's not like that at all. Right. No, understood. So you're bringing up something that has just come come from a craftsman and yes. turning it into a showroom piece. That's right. Yes. Now, so g g give me g name me some of the pieces that 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 you look after and um, uh, and get ready for public scrutiny that that our audience might have heard of. Well, we. Um, the most recent one, I just had connections with the Ryder Cup. I was, I, as you know, I'm a freelance, so I could be in one company and I would be, I actually did the, um, a casket which was shaped like a book for the Ryder Cup. And then the next day I would be in a company and it would be doing jewellery and I would be doing the Ryder Cup cufflinks. Um, I've also I restored the America's Cup which was damaged, um, which was damaged by Maori in New Zealand over land rights, and it was uh, 150 years old, and um, it was pretty smashed up, and uh, I managed to get my hands on it well to um, restore, and that was quite an interesting... But didn't you restore it and then have to make it look 150 years old again? That's right, I had to make it look 150 again. years old. Yes, I remember reading about that. <laughs> and uh, I was filmed uh, for New Zealand... I think it was, they made a film out of it over there, and they, it was quite comical for the presenter to say, "I mean, to say that you make it look new, then you make it look old again." And I go, "Yes," because <laughs> there was all fresh engraving, and I had to wear the engraving out so it look looked old. And then I use an oxidising solution, and I blacked the completely up so it was all black. So oh, then I rub it all off. <laughs> So it leaves it all in the nooks and crannies, all in the engraving and all in the chasing. So now, you've followed some other fairly strict rules yourself, I understand, because you've had a lot of connections with the royal family. Yes. And uh, I imagine the rules of getting access to some of the royal family's uh, bits of silver are fairly strict. Oh, so strict. It was... I had... Um, I had to go to the um, Crown Jewels in the Tower of London and um, my boss, all he said to me was, I've got your pass, just bring your camera. And then I was um, brought into the jewel house and I was introduced to the, a wine system, which was, um, um, I think it was 1830. And it, um, it weighed a quarter of a tonne and my boss yes. just said, take photographs, then the silversmith will take that apart now. You get your photographs developed, and then it was lacquered. It was, um, it was fire gilt. So that fire gilt is something which is banned now. They used to do a paste, you know, with a mercury and gold, and used to paste it on. And it's really, really heavy. It's really good. It's much better than what we could ever do now but a lot of people died through doing it. Anyway, it was lacquered. And I actually had to be in the Tower of London for 11 days, and I took all the lacquer off. But all these photographs were confiscated, so we couldn't oh. make it again. And um, I was never allowed to take a piece out of the office I was working in. Very, very strict. So I've not even got a, a memory of that particular occasion. And I was oh, an underarm guard. Police. That was the police actually involved. Normally the beef eaters are the police of the Tower of London, but they brought in armed police to protect. protect well, the there's people. not. 
there's not many Englishmen alive today that can be say they've been held under armed guard in the Tower of London. No, definitely not. <laughs> so, certainly none still living. That's I've got to say that. <laughs> now, what's all talking about the royal family? What's all this about the Queen's teapot? Oh yeah, I used to. The the Queen used to send her um, teapot in because I worked for the Crown Jewellers. So she would like send in the, her little teapot, which was just enough for her cup. And um, you know, you've got all the tea stain in the in the teapot. So mm. I would clean it for her. I would use some. Um, so we, uh, we use some very high, you know, very dangerous poisons. Like um, it's a caustic soda, and you would um, put it in hot into the teapot and leave it hot, and leave it to soak. And eventually, Blimey, if you got if you got that wrong, you'd be back in the Tower of London oh, well, for be, different reasons. <laughs> Head on the um, block. It's quite funny. Uh, you say then we use uh, once it's it's sort of loosening off. I tip that away, and I use these um, what we call them. Um, it's a scratch brush, which is a brass brush, and we put it onto um, a, like it's a buffing, buffing machine, but it's got water with a tap running onto it. And you fill the teapot up with soapy water, then you put the, it's like a cup sort of brush, and while it's rotating, you put the teapot in, and you put the brush into the inside of the teapot, and it brushes all the tanning out. So it gets it very, very clean, so it's brand new again. Because I was always taught never to clean the inside of a teapot, yes. just to clean the outside. So, well, I always used to do it for the Queen, and the Queen Mother as well. Oh, the right. teapots were always cleaned by, by me for that. But they're not done, they're only done maybe once a year, because yeah. the build-up of the, of the, with the holes, you know, you need to get it clean, because it won't pour so good otherwise. Now, talking about the Queen Mum, in the last podcast I did with Jim Grice about staff training and so on, I mentioned that horror story I'd had when I was mess manager for the Royal Army Medical Corps, and she's, she was colonel-in-chief at the time, about one of my uh, porters scrubbing, a, um, scrubbing the cups with a billow pad in soapy water. And I, th and I said to you in our email, getting this yes. interview set up, that I bet it made your toes curl, and I'm sure it did. <laughs> But the thing was that once we'd stopped that and, and spent a lot of time polishing correctly, all those Brillo pad scratches we did actually lose. So does that mean that every time you're polishing silver, you are sort of a, taking a little bit of the, uh, some molecules off the surface oh, every time? Definitely, definitely. It's, um, it's the, the best thing, although I hate it, is, is silver dip. Silver dip does not take anything off. Yeah, no abrasion at all. No, but the trouble is with silver dip, it's a quick fix for for doing it. Say somebody's coming, you want to dip it in silver dip, it's got to be fresh, it's got to be new, and it works pretty instantly. But, mm. you know, maybe in a month's time, that will be back to what it was, and it goes quicker. And um, I did talk with um, various other polishers, and especially specifically... Uh, Buckingham Palace, and um, we was discussing about this silver dip, and um, I said, well, how do you dry it off? And they went, well, we just put it in hot water. And I went, that's not the thing to be doing, because I've had things come back from people that put these articles into the silver dip, hot water, immediately oxidise. And once it's oxidised with silver dip, it's very, very difficult to polish off by hand. So it has to end up coming to me to remove what with my machine. Right. And now, if but, something's... It, yeah, sorry, go on. So, but the trouble is, when you start polishing with machines, you do lose your patina on the outside. Right. So I prefer really only using silver dip on new pieces rather than antique pieces. Right. Now, that sort of brings me to a question then, because I've found that having used silver dip and polished traditional way. What was the name of that pink powder that I had to mix with water? Well, I, I, I would suspect that pink powder would be a whitening powder mixed with a little bit of powder rouge. Ah, right. That's the only thing I can think. I still use whitening powder now for polishing, mm -hmm. but with an antique, I never introduce any rouge to an antique ever. It gives right. it a too bright a finish. Because sometimes I found that polishing by hand using cream or yes. um, anything like that, the, the, the end result would have a, 
a deeper is that yes. the pattern a deeper burnish yes, look to yes. it you know and it looks so much better than just the shiny white silver of a new piece is that what you mean by patina that's right yes there's with older pieces they have well in everything uh, there's this thing called uh, called fire and this is created when the piece is heated up because it has copper in the silver it actually gets heated up and the copper comes to the surface well in these new times things are everything's like a quick fix and what they do they polish it up and they don't care about this pinky fire they might be very patchy and they just silver plate it so everything is a uniform color but on the old silver obviously they didn't have this and it has a lovely color it has this lovely sort of pinky color which we used to call fire finish and I used to get the silversmith to I polished it all up and then I get the silversmith to heat it up to introduce the copper to the surface then I would polish it up slightly again just to bring it up so there's a glow on there then I'd get him to do it again and we'd gradually bring out the copper in the silver to make it look more antique because I always noticed when polishing very hard that the silver would get quite hot in a way. Well, it's a very good conductor, you see. And right. silver is not um, actually as thick as what you think. When you've got a teapot, you've got all the castings on there, which is the castings would be the spout and the sockets and everything like that. And they make the teapot feel a little bit heavier. So the actual right. teapot where it holds the tea is not that thick. So when you're rubbing it does get hot quicker and for me it does get hot obviously when I'm, I'm my machine polishes 3,000 revs a minute so nice. it's get you can imagine you polishing 3,000 <laughs> times you couldn't do it in a minute with no a duster way. but with a machine that I use which is a buffing machine which you, you might have seen when you was at school you know when you was in metal work we all yeah. used to use these little buffing lathes but not for the silver and we, we use, for cleaning the silver after, which is a very useful machine, and it's called an ultrasonic tank. And it, I just basically, I put some soapy liquid in there with water, and I turn it on, it sends a high frequency through, through the solution. And when you put, um, say, a teapot in there, it, it gets all the dirt out, and it gets inside the spout as well. So it cleans it out. Now, that's the sort of stuff you've got in your workshop, yes. but, they, but you train, uh, for example, silver men from, from the army, like I, yes. like I was just talking about. You've also trained, for example, Camilla Parker Bowles, his butler, yes. um, and various other people, how to polish silver. But they obviously haven't got that sort of equipment. So what products and uh, p bits of equipment do you recommend that they use in, for example, a private home? Or, yes, you know, I understand. Like All right. I, I've been thinking about this because um, every time I find a silver polish that I really like, they stop making it. Silvo polish, which is like... Yeah. Like Brasso. Yeah, like a Brasso, but it's a silver one. It's, yeah. it's just called Silvo. And that actually has some of this tarnish guard in it. And it coats the silver and it's less likely to tarnish. But it has this funny smell it has a perfume smell but if you really smell into the background of it you can smell the silver dip smell so ah. what I, I use that quite well I, I would recommend that sort of polish with um, a horsehair brush yeah it's a very soft sort of brush you know the white bristle brushes and yeah. I, I actually what I would do is I I get a I make sure a butler would be wearing gloves latex mm -hmm. gloves or the white cotton gloves because your fingers contain acid and if you're a bit hot on that day you know it's a very hot day and you're sweating the sweat comes out of your hands onto the silver immediately if you was to look at that i've seen it myself you get an imprint of your fingers fingerprints yeah, seen that, eaten yeah. on there straight away so i would recommend using gloves and say a silver polish and i use say i, I apply it with a duster and then I would wipe it off. But the thing is, um, you, with, sometimes things are chased. So you get all this white paste all in the 
all in the chasing and all in the patterns and everything. So I use a horse hair brush. Right. And we actually have in the trade a finish called a butler finish. And that is created by us. And it's meant to show how the butler would be looking after silver for over the years. And he would be polishing it with his dusters. And there would be little slight scratches in it, like little circles where, he, where he's rubbed. And I would polish this piece up. And then I would get my horsehair brush. And I would rub it around in circles, just like the butler would. Then I'd get my polish again, and then I'd go over with a duster, and I'd rub it very hard, and then I would do it again with the with with the brush again, and then eventually you get it looking like the butler would be, you know, looking after it for maybe a hundred years worth of looking after. And so I say to you, look, use a silver polish, use a silver dip, but not on antiques. Never use a silver dip on antiques. Right. Um, a very good thing is for, for, to make an interest for a butler is a hallmarking book. So you actually get yes. to recognise if it is silver and how old it is. And is sterling silver really the best? Uh, Britannia silver is the best. Right. It's a bit softer, but it's quite a nice colour. And But uh, with the interest, it is an interest of the hallmarking that... I wanted to say was if you just get into it no you don't really need to know every single thing but when you go far back you go back to Georgian times they have a little picture on the hallmark of George and it's a man's head and if he's turning to the left it's an older Georgian if he's turning to the right he's early Georgian see so Right. And you've got the same with Victoria. You've got Victoria's going one way, she's an early, the other way's later. We used to have a Georgian finish and a Victorian finish. So I used to be able to know what finishes to do because the Victorian finish would be slightly brighter than the Georgian. Yeah. We were saying don't use silver dip on antiques. Tell me some other things never to do. I mean, in an email I got from you the other day, you were talking about rubber bands. Oh, yeah. Rubber bands. Never put a rubber band on, on silver ever. Some people... So if you've, got like six, if you've got six silver fish forks, don't hold them together with no, a rubber band no. when storing. No, because I just did something this week, and I removed the elastic band, and it was etched in. The, it's um, just etched in there so deep that it has to be seriously polished back, which means then you're losing silver. Yeah, of course. And the other thing I was saying about is salt. And if you notice with salt cellars, they're always gold-plated inside, or they always mm. have a blue liner. Yeah, glass liner, yeah. Yeah, because of the salt. It's like, it's, nothing, it's just like a rust. And it goes, it goes so black, you see these black pits all over silver. And no matter what you do, as a, even as a butler or as a, a polisher like myself, you, you take a lot of metal off to get to the depth. And when you think you've removed all this black, it comes back because it's still in the metal. And the only way I've discovered of actually stopping this salt coming back is leaving it in a cyanide solution for maybe a day. And, it's actually, oh, and that, that leaches the salt out of the right, metal. That's right, it stops it. And... Um, so then I can actually polish it, and then there's, you know, it's not going to come back again. But um, you do lose a lot of metal, because obviously it's like a rust on the car. You've got to go right down to the bottom of that, that pit, so you've lost mm. a lot of metal. Well, you've worked for the Royal Jewellers and so on, but you've been doing a lot of work for a modern jeweller called, is it Theo Fennel called, or Theo Fennel? Uh, it's called Theo Fennel. Theo Fennell. I've definitely sit past his shop in oh, London and know... We've no, got a place in well. the um, Fulham Road in South, near South Kensington. Yeah, that's where I've seen it, definitely. And, and, and Theo the man, because of Theo the company, PLC, Theo Fennell the man, he's, um, he's a celebrity jeweller designer. And um, mm. what happened was, is when I was, uh, say, five years ago, I, I was made redundant by the Crown Jewellers, and I was completely at a loss how to 
continue my trade because I actually loved it. What am I going to do? So I can I continue to do as I do. I was polishing various pieces for the church. But what happened was what CO actually gave me a workshop. Gives it, continues to do this for me, and he he gives it to me rent free. Very 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 nice man. He's actually very very keen on keeping the craft alive and. He's he's given me a workshop with my own telephone number. I actually polish some of the well. I look after all his special commission jewellery, and I look after all of the silver stock, which is loads of stores. We have Harrods, we have Harvey Nichols, we have Selfridges. He has all these little stores within stores. So I'm responsible for some weird and wacky pieces of silver and some yeah. And some very nice pieces of jewellery. I mean, the, the the things that Theo is actually very famous for would be like the marmite. He actually does a marmite jar with a silver lid. Did he do? Yes. I, or did he do that Worcester sauce yeah, bottle? Right. Ah, and that's the ketchup, it. I remember. And the ketchup. Yes, ketchup. that's right. Yeah, I've seen and we that. We do. I've just recently just done this week uh, telegrams, silver telegrams, which is uh, they're really a nice idea, and we have some major celebrities actually using those when they've been away for a weekend and actually would send these silver postcards to a person to say thank you. Oh, right. Excellent. So, uh, what a good idea. Yeah, it's a, it is a different world, but um, I am really grateful to, to Theo, you know, for helping me continue because five years ago I was thinking, well, what am I going to do? Well, it's very interesting to me that in your career – uh, a very tr- traditional career. Uh, you've gone from uh, doing something with an 1830s wine system in the Tower of London to polishing uh, a marmite, <laughs> yeah. a silver marmite jar for for a very modern jeweller, and and even I understand platinum mobile phones. Yeah, what was all that mobile about? telephones is um, something that's quite up and coming. I was um, consultant to um, quite a major firm, and there. They're very concerned about making sure that when they sell these phones, they they sell them in gold and they sell them in platinum. And they're, they're really, really uh, keen to make sure that these pieces are looked after. Well, it's, I think it's just amazing that your um, your talents are still in demand yeah. in, in, in a very modern world. And long, long may that continue. Um, anyway, it's been great talking to you, Stephen. I could go on for yes, ages because yes. it's a topic I find I find incredibly interesting. But I hope our our, uh, our listeners have too, and and they've and they've garnished some good information out I of hope that. So, so uh, well, many thanks, Stephen, and uh, and no doubt we'll speak again Definitely. soon. Any many, other many questions? Thanks. You know, just feel free, and I'll come back to you with the answers. A lot of the links are on my website for various tool companies, which might be handy for the butler right i'll be including a link to your website and any other links uh, on this article so all uh, all our visitors have to do is look be- just beneath this podcast yes. and all the relevant information will be okay, there thank you Clyde. okay Stephen. many thanks okay, god bless you very much okay bye Well, lots of Butler Bureau gratitude winging its way to Stephen Goldsmith. If you've got any questions about silversmithing, fine metal polishing, got any issues with your silverware, post in the comments below and I'm sure Stephen will be happy to reply. Okay, that's it for this edition of the Butler Bureau Show and look forward to seeing you next time. Cheerio for now.